Tonight we're going to hopefully uh, finish up chapter 11 and then move into chapter 12. And uh, we'll meet some new and uh, exotic creatures. <laughs> but uh, powerful stuff once it gets a hold of you and can really motivate and enable us in our, in our discipleship. So as, as we begin, let's, uh, I, I wonder, before we just pray for ourselves, uh, I, I, I imagine most of you have been following the developments in Afghanistan and mm -hmm. the fall of Kabul. Uh, and, uh, but uh, I've been pick, was doing some reading, trying to get some information about uh, the state of the church. There, there are Christians in Afghanistan, not a ton. I remember a few years ago, Ken and Andrew White from, from uh, England, he was pastoring the St. George's Anglican Church in Kabul. And uh, he came and spoke at our church in Geneva, Illinois. And it was just amazing what God had been doing in and through St. George's and elsewhere. But obviously, as the Taliban have, have increased their control, uh, there's a tremendous amount of pressure on <coughs> not only the general population, but particularly Christians will be targeted. And um, so it's, you know, we're reading about martyrs and persecutions, but we're about to see something potentially in Afghanistan that would bring us right up to date, sadly. So I think it'd be good if we just pray for uh, God's help and enablement for the believers who are there. Um, passed on an article to, to Dave, and he's going to work it through a bit. But uh, one organization, World Vision, are you familiar with World Vision? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Well, they have about, I didn't know it, but they have 300 Afghan uh, staff in Afghanistan, yes. and uh, they're all, at this point, as of whenever the article came in on the web yesterday or today, well, but um, they just talked about the tremendous impact that's going to be on children, especially, and um, not to mention girls and young girls and young women. So it's going to be a difficult time, and regardless of the politics or who does what or America's response, we need to pray for uh, that, that fledgling church that's there. Many have uh, gone to other countries as able, and they're refugees. And believers have been leaving for the last few years because the, the tremendous pressure. You know, it's a solidly Muslim country and a fanatical um, Taliban, pretty, pretty uh, anti-Christian, obviously. So anyway, I wonder if several of us could just lift up the believers in, in Afghanistan, pray for God's protection and help. pray for protection and guidance and wisdom, Lord God, mm -hmm. and that your spirit would work through you. <coughs> and Father, we pray that your Holy Spirit is there. We pray, Lord God, that you will be sovereign and that your will be done and that you be glorified, Lord God, through this event. Protect those people. Mm -hmm. Lord, you promised that you would not leave us as orphans, that you would come to be with us. We pray, Lord God, that by your Holy Spirit that you would encourage and strengthen the believers, that as they get together in small groups that you would move in their midst and that you would give them your wisdom and the uh, direction as to what they might do to serve you and that you would preserve them, Lord God, and that you would watch after them. Father, as we sit here in a very safe and secure place, it's hard for us to picture ourselves in that kind of a situation where a knock on the door could mean uh, life or death. So we, we thank you for your, the blessing of, of being in this place, of being able to gather as a group of men and open your word in freedom. We pray that you will guide us as we look at these passages in your revelation to us of who you are and what you're doing to, to prepare us for what we need to face now and, and what's coming in the future. So thank you. Guide us by your spirit. Give us uh, insight and um, the ability to apply it to our lives afresh. 
for the commitment of time in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Thank you. All right, gentlemen, I'm an old biker mechanic and we're wearing masks, so I need you all to yell. <laughs> Please. Could you not hear me even when I was praying? I'm getting bits and pieces. But oh, I'm sorry. Okay, I'll try and speak. I don't have a loud voice. really muffles it. I know. I don't have a loud voice to begin with, but I'll do my best. Yeah. Um, just by way of a quick summary, you know, we started Revelation a, a number of weeks ago. And um, remember, the opening chapter was this picture of, of Christ who he was, and all his glory and his, his majesty. And then chapters 2 and 3 were, was written for a specific audience. And you remember who was that audience that it was directed to? The church. The church. Yeah, the seven churches within present-day Turkey, in a certain area of, of Turkey. And, um, and although it was specific to those groups, still, they represented, I think, churches down through the ages and have messages for all of us, including St. Paul's in our individual lives. And then in chapters 4 and 5, heaven is opened, and there's this majestic vision of, of, of the throne and what's around it, and um, all the glory of God on the throne and, and, and of Christ. And it's just a, a magnificent uh, portrait of, of, of what's there. But then... Once you get into chapters 5 and onward, then it gets difficult because that's when it starts in with the judgment. But the judgments flow from a righteous, holy God, not a, not a, uh, a perverted dictator, you know, some guy who takes great pleasure in, <coughs> in hurting innocent people, nothing like that. What unfolds is, is, is due, overdue. And yet, in the midst of that, we see his grace and mercy, and lives are spared, and opportunities are given to people to repent, to, to come to, to accept him as, as Lord and Savior. And there's, you know, from <coughs> chapters uh, 5 and 6 and, and onwards, we see, we, in, including what we're dealing with now, we see a series of judgments. There's three different judgments, and we've covered two of those. Do you remember what those judgments are? This is sort of a pop quiz, guys. What was the first judgment? There was, what was it called? There were seven parts of it. The seven seals. 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 Yeah, seven seals. And and as things got worse, and you know, there were the four horses initially of the apocalypse, and and things got pretty grim, and and there's this cry, who in the world can stand? Who can live and, and face a holy God and all this righteous wrath that's coming up? How can a believer survive in all this? And the answer to that was, who can stand? Those who are sealed by the Holy Spirit that God claims as his own. And so it's the assurance to every believer that, um, that we will be protected, not, not necessarily safe physically, but we will be protected eternally. We'll be his forever. And um, then you come up to chapter 7, and you start in the, the, the seventh seal introduces a, n a new set of judgments. And do you remember what that is? What those were called? We're still at the end of that. Was that the scrolls? The seven what? Was that the scrolls? Well, the scrolls were part of the, uh, the, the seal. Seals. Yeah. Da, 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 da. The seven trumpets. 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 So that, that starts in, in, in chapter 8 on. But um, in chapter 7, where it talks about the sealing of, of believers, uh, they're described also as this 144,000. And some have felt that it was literal 144,000 ethnic Jews who would be saved in the last days. But for various reasons, a lot of scholars feel that they represent the church of God, the body of Christ. And, and when you come now to in, into chapter 11, as the trumpets are continuing, we're coming up uh, in verse uh, what is this, uh, 15 to the seventh trumpet. But we've been talking last week about these two witnesses. And again, it starts by, this, uh, there's a description of, of the temple area 
and we looked at that. And that temple area was made up of, there was this community, the holy city, the community of, uh, of believers there. And then what would happen to those who are outside of that protected area, um, unbelievers. And, um, and we saw that these, there were two witnesses, and, and for various reasons, it's felt that these could be two literal witnesses, uh, extraordinary witnesses, but it seems that they're two, that they probably are representative <coughs> of, of, prophetic, of, of gifted men and women down through the years who have particularly stood up and declared God's truth. And, and behind that, they're, they're true of the whole body of Christ. In the next chapter, in chapter 12, we're going to be introduced to the woman and her kind. And there we see another picture of, 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 the, of the body of Christ. So you have the, you have the 144,000, these two witnesses, and again, in the chapter 12, we're going to see another figure introduced. <coughs> that, uh, uh, for various reasons, uh, I think, introduces the body of Christ, as we'll see. So anyway, but the point of <coughs> two witnesses, as we saw, was that they, they, they speak out boldly the word of God. They proclaim truth. And there are results of that. I mean, they, they, they back up their claims with dramatic signs and so forth. However, in the middle of all of this, suddenly what happens to them? Remember? These two witnesses. They're killed. Yeah, they're killed. killed. And you say, wait a minute. <laughs> Isn't it supposed to happen, you know? And but how? how what, what happened after they were killed? Do you remember? Yeah, they went to heaven and resurrected. Yeah, they were three days, three and a half days later. They were brought back to life, and and um, and so it, it, it was. And then they were caught up to heaven in a cloud, while their enemies looked on. Uh, and you say, what in the world is going on here? Uh, any thoughts? This is sort of where we end, ended last week. So I, was, I did this for those of you who haven't been tracking this every week to, to catch us up. Any ideas what in the world these, uh, is going on here with these, you know, suddenly they're killed and then they're raised up and taken to heaven? What, that, what might that represent? Any ideas? I, I had a thought about the two witnesses I mentioned to you uh -huh. uh, and uh, the law and the prophets. So, um, and I was reading the story about the rich man and Lazarus, yeah. and um, the rich man ended up going to hell, and uh, the uh, poor Lazarus went to heaven to Abraham's bosom, and um, the request was to send somebody to tell to tell his family, mm -hmm. you know that that um, you know this place is real, and he says you, you have the law and the prophets, mm -hmm. and so the law and the prophets are. Jesus often referred that those are the witnesses mm -hmm. that, that testify. Um, yeah. That's, thank you. Yeah. Some have felt that these, go ahead. No, that Moses being the law yeah. and Elijah being the prophet. Yeah. Right, right. Yeah. And others feel that they, they could represent these two witnesses, you know, Jewish and Gentile Christians. Yeah. You know, so in the end, we don't know. But anyway, they represent God and proclaim his truth and although there's this setback, they're killed, they're brought back to life, and what do you think might that represent or what, how would, how would we explain that? Any ideas? Well just similar to Jesus being in the tomb for, for three days mm -hmm. and then rising. Yeah. It would also really scare the uh, Scare the locals watching, watching this happen. <laughs> these guys that are rotting in the streets suddenly come back to life. That's true. Yeah. But there'd be a death and a resurrection that's followed by eternal life. Mm -hmm. So that the law and the prophets are eternal. Yeah. As Christ was. Yeah. It seems kind of funny after all this, that's what's spiritual. <laughs> I mean, think about what they went through. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And many of them start to repent after that. And that's yeah. what's really crazy. Yeah. Well, it's interesting, too, that there was an earthquake, similar to the earthquake when Christ was crucified. Yeah, that's right. And I mean, yeah. you're talking about a tenth of the city was killed. I mean, that would scare the heck out of everybody. Yeah. Wake we'll them up a little bit. Wasn't Lazarus raised when he was pulled up three and a half days before? Right. Yeah, that's right. Yeah, for four days on the road. Yeah. Like the sister said, after four days, he stinks. <laughs> Any other thoughts? 
Exactly. So, I mean, regardless of the details, what, what comes across to, to me is that the point that is that the Church of Jesus Christ cannot be destroyed. It can be temporarily set back. It can look like it's been obliterated. And that's happened down through the centuries. There's been times when it looks like Christianity was going extinct. And it, that, I mean, look at North Korea, for instance. They've done everything they could to obliterate any idea of, of Christ in North Korea. But guess what? There are believers there. Not masses of them, but there are underground believers. And that, last week we talked about China, you know, and going from a million Protestants and three million uh, Catholics in, in, in 1951 to today close to 100 million uh, believers. Uh, the same can be said in Russia. Russia did everything it could to exterminate you know, the, the myths of Christianity and all this nonsense, you know, the opiate of the people as they described religion. And guess what? Even Putin goes to church. <laughs> <laughs> the church is stronger than it ever has been in Russia. Not that there aren't issues and, and difficulties. And we go on and on. And even when we're facing this terrible tragedy, you know, in Afghanistan, I have hope that out of this will come resurrection for, for some. And, um, and then I, you know, I, we could go on and on and talk about different parts of Africa or Cambodia that I mentioned before when Pol Pot came into power. And there was, out of a population of, of 8 million people, it was estimated 3 million people lost their lives in Cambodia through genocide and disease and uh, the torture. I, I, I've been there a number of times and, and uh, seen some of the effects of that. But anyway, all this to say, and even in Japan, historically, they did everything in the 1600s. They, they, when Christianity had come in, they did everything they could to try and eliminate all Christians out of it. And so they closed the doors and said, none of this Jesus stuff. Of course, unfortunately, it was linked with sort of um, trade and, and power and political, you know, a, a desire to colonize Japan. And Christianity was sort of seen as coming in on the coattails of all that that agenda, and therefore it was really given a bad rap, and, uh, and therefore was seen as, as the enemy. All right. What is it like today? Where? In, in Japan. In Japan? Uh, well, there, there's a church there, but it only represents about 1% of the population. Uh, so it didn't completely go away. Oh, no, no. Oh, no. The church is there. Yeah. I, I did, did, start did three get, churches. <laughs> did, you get, did you get into Burma, or could you just comment on Burma? And, and yeah, in Myanmar today, Kenya? yeah. Oh, especially in the north, among some of the tribal groups, the Karen and Kachin. Really? There, there's thousands and thousands of Christians. Really? Among mainline Buddhists in, in Myanmar, uh, it's, there's much fewer. That's, the Bamar are the biggest <laughs> challenge to, to missions, that, that, that ethnic group. So, but yeah, th there's a church, there are believers in every... I think every every nation in the world, 180 of them, but it's um, in some places it's open, in other places it's closed. But there's no ultimate closed nation to the gospel. The Holy Spirit can take His word and His messengers one way or another, and get to the hearts of people who are seeking them. But by implication, I think you're saying, as in this science, but after three and a half days, the breath of life from God entered them goes back perhaps to the temple will be destroyed and I'll rebuild it in three mm -hmm. days. That's, that's a good point. It's just point. a question of how many hours there are in each of those days. Yeah. yeah. So in each case, something is being destroyed to try and eradicate faith, mm -hmm. but it's coming back in a matter of time. Mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah. So, interesting thought. Let's, let's go in then to this last section in chapter 11 starting the, the seventh trump, trumpet. My glasses keep fogging up, driving me nuts. <laughs> <laughs> you Mine too. Anyway, uh, would someone please read fifth, verse 15 <coughs> down through the end of the chapter, through uh, 19, is it? I'll do it. Okay, thank you. And the seventh angel sounded, and there were, there were great voices in heaven, saying, The kingdoms of this world are become the kingdoms of our Lord and of his Christ and he shall reign forever and ever. And the four and twenty elders which sat before God on their seats 
fell upon their faces and worshiped God, saying, We give thee thanks, O Lord God Almighty, which art and wast and art to come, because thou hast taken thee thy great power and hast reigned. And the nations were angry, and thy wrath is come in the time of the dead, that they should be judged, and that thou shouldest give, give reward unto thy servants, the prophets, and to the saints, and them that fear thy name, small and great, and should destroy them which destroy the earth. And the temple of God was opened in heaven, and there was seen in his temple the ark of his testament, and there were lightnings and voices and thunderings and an earthquake and great hail. Thank you. Um, what are your impressions as you read through this uh, sort of summary? There's a lot of a uh, lot of angry people that are angry at God, and God's going to do what, what He will anyway. Mm -hmm. He doesn't doesn't care about angry people. <laughs> what else caught your attention? Or So the, the Ark of the Covenant, there it is. Yeah. The, the true, the true Ark is in heaven. Um, the one that was on earth, as the writer of Hebrews tells us, is a copy of that, an imitation of that, and we'll get into that in a minute. But uh, notice how it starts. He said, you know, they, they said this with loud voices. That, that, what impression does that give? Showtime. Showtime. <laughs> does, does that first verse, you know, the kingdom of the world, this world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of his Christ. Does that ring a bell? You've probably sung it how many times or heard it sung? Oh, yeah. yeah. From where? From where? Yeah. Handel's Messiah. Yep. Yeah, King of Kings, Lord of Lords. Lord. Yeah, yeah, Handel. And uh, that's, you know, that... that and this summarizes, this looks ahead to the key things that are going to unfold in the next, in the following chapters up to the end in chapter 21. This, this is sort of a summary of, of what's to fall, a synopsis, as it were. It's, it's interesting how it's not just God watching and knowing what's going on. It's all of the elders and everything watching mm. and seeing what's going on mm. and, and following it. You know, I mean, uh, I tend to think, you know, God in his majesty knows what's going on, but they're all obviously envisioning it. They're, they're, they're dropping the tray every time he does something great, so they must be aware of what's going on. But aren't they all the saints under the altar? Yeah. Lord. That's what I mean. So they're with God. So it's not only God watching what's going on. They have a sense. Or are they going to be bowing down? God's yes, and, and they're giving thanks because of what... What exactly. has done for them. Exactly. And they want, I hate to use the word promote, but I'm going to. They, they want to promote the fact that God has produced. Exactly. And they, the word. But it's interesting that all of them get to watch what's going on. I think that's interesting. Yeah. And what was yeah. that part where it said that the altar there? It says, um, the martyrs, the mm -hmm. yeah. It says, how much longer? Yeah. Right. And they said, be patient. Yeah. So, yeah. Well, this is it. Yeah. He's telling me. It's vegan. It's I, I heard a sermon years ago when I was in seminary in Dallas, Texas, by a, a, a well-known um, Baptist minister, and, and the title of the sermon was "Payday Someday." Payday someday. Boy, did he preach that! <laughs> but that that, in a sense, is what's happening here. Payday, that which they deserve, will be coming. And, and that's true also for believers. There will be rewards, as we'll look at in a minute. But I want us to unpack this verse that begins this, this summary statement. Look, look at it a little more. I, you know, squeeze it a bit and see. I just got bad sir. Unpack it a, a bit more. What is this announcing? It's announcing that Satan is being thrown off the... Off the uh 
whatever the big chair is of the king to ascend. Yeah, the throne. Just Satan's been thrown off the off the throne of the earth, and uh, now God, God, they have a new new sheriff for God. Mm. God. God's taking it back. It's kind of like that. Uh, the, 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 there might be a sign in front of a church that says, uh, "The wages of sin is death. Repent before payday." <laughs> so it's, God's coming back, and it's payday. Good. See, and the other thing I just I noticed here is the elders were sitting on thrones, so they're actually reigning. They're reigning with God. In a similar way, we are, we are kings and priests, and we are reigning here in the domain that God has given us to march around our vocation and everything. And they are truly reigning with Him. Um, it's, it's quite yeah. mysterious. Yeah, there's a sense here in which I mean, one way to put that is when you it says the kingdom of the world has become the kingdom of our Lord and of His Christ. We're talking about a regime change. Yeah. We're talking about a transfer of so-called power from this world to its rightful owner. And that's actually taking place now. You are and I, are, are, aren't we a product of that regime change? Where is our loyalty now? We should be with God. Yeah. But obviously by looking at the world, where things are happening in the world, Satan still has sway. Oh, he does. Much of this world. That's for sure. And I... I Verse 4 or so, Christ said this, and we give thanks to you, good Lord God Almighty, who is and who was. Mm -hmm. So it struck me that one. Yeah. And it says, to you who have taken your great power, and now he's, begin, he's going to begin to reign. Mm -hmm. yeah. 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 So he's going to put all that power into carrying this out. But yeah. the, who is and who was? Verse 19 reinforces that through all the praise, through all the expectations of things to come, in the end, the Ark of the Covenant is behind it all. Mm. And the Ark of the Covenant goes back to uh, Noah, Moses, Old Testament, Old Testament. Right? So, so that we, we are driven Contemporary times to take contemporary action, but behind it all still is the Ark of the Covenant, which was a covenant God made with the people many years ago. Any other observations? Well, at least we know where the Ark of the Covenant was. <laughs> 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 He's been looking at it for a long time. running all over the place looking for it. <laughs> Let's look at Jeff, that. you can find it in Ethiopia. There's one in every church, I understand. <laughs> <laughs> Is that right? Yeah, yeah, it's quite a few. Yeah, I heard that. Well, and, and the statement is really to the non-believers, those that are being persecuted. Because... As believers, you know that God was and is and is to come, that he always was sovereign, it was always his world, and it was just a matter of time until this happened. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why the next statement is who, who is and who was. Yeah. I mean, that's, I, that's something to tuck under your pillow at night um, after watching the new, evening news or something like that. Who, who's ultimately in control? Who's ultimately whose kingdom is coming and uh, will finally replace <coughs> what's here. Um, the, the, it's a bit intriguing, don't you think? What is this? Um, uh, well, before we get to the, well, let's do the temple. Then I want to back up and talk about the rewarding business that is going on here. Look at, would somebody read for me uh, Hebrews chapter 9, verses 11 to 12. And then there's another brief section in Hebrews 10, but just starting with Hebrews 9, 11 to 12. When Christ came as high priest of the good things that are already here, he went through the greater and more perfect tabernacle that is not made man's, that is to say, not a part of this creation. He did not enter by means of the blood of goats and calves, but entered the most holy place once for all by his own blood, having obtained eternal redemption. And then chapter 10, verses 19 to 22. Somebody else like to read that? 
chapter 10, 19 to 22. Having therefore, brethren, boldness to enter into the holiest, into the holiest of, by the blood of Jesus, by a new and living way which he hath consecrated for us through the veil, that is to say, his flesh, and having an high priest over the house of God, let us draw near with a true heart and full assurance of, of faith, having our hearts sprinkled from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Thank you. So what is, what is this Ark of the Covenant? Let's look at it first. What do you think it represents, the, the current Ark in heaven, the Ark of the Covenant? The promise of God. Is it also the very presence of God? I think the ark is a symbol of what Christ did on the cross by way of shedding his blood and to pay for, pay the price for, for our redemption. And therefore, it's an eternal symbol of, of Christ's sacrificial act for us and his agreement. Remember, we, he says a new, a new agreement, a new covenant I, I'm, I'm making with you. In other words, I, one pastor said, a new arrangement for living. Here's a new way I want you to live. And Jeremiah talks about that, a new covenant. He says, he says, no longer will you have to just be a slave to a bunch of rules. You don't do this and don't do that. Uh, don't cuss, don't swear, don't chew, and go with girls that do, they used to say. <laughs> but, but I think, uh, I don't know where that came from. So. <laughs> it happens. <laughs> but now we have immediate and full access to, to the throne because of what Christ did for us. And so I think that the ark there is the, is the symbol of, of Christ's finished work on our behalf. And so let's, let's back up for just a minute and, uh, and let's look at uh, the time has come for uh, judging the dead and, and that the few sentences that before 19. So that, what is that? <coughs> Verse 18, can somebody reread that for us? Verse 18? Yeah. Now we're remission of. No, I'm sorry. We're back in chapter Revelation. Oh, sorry. Oh, oh. sorry about. Oh. That. Excuse me, folks. Sorry. I get carried away. The nations raged for your wrath came, and the time for the dead to be judged, and for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and those who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying the destroyers of the earth. you think this is saying? Rewarding your servants? Is this in the judgment? Judging them and rewarding them by choosing them? Is that what that's saying? Anybody want to respond to that question? God chooses us. That's what I mean. Yeah, it's it's, it's, it's chosen. being chosen is our reward. No, he, he chooses who gets saved. Oh, so yeah. It says, for rewarding your servants. Are the, I'm sorry. Are, are the servants, the prophets, and the saints under the altar? Are they be, is, is that another way they're being rewarded or, or identified to be rewarded? After all, it's the 144,000 who are sealed. And, and it's those people who are under the altar who are protected, at least my perception. They are protected from being the two thirds that keeps being cut off. In the oh, beginning of the book, weren't they already rewarded by being under the altar? I, I, well, I don't know. I feel a lot better under the throne. <laughs> <laughs> well, I think it's talking about the judgment in general, and those that do not believe in Jesus Christ will get His wrath, and those that are believers, the saints, whether they're the martyrs or everyone else who believes, will be rewarded, and the reward is to be in heaven with. God. So I think it's just making the distinction there will be a judgment, all will be judged. Those that don't know have the wrath, those that do know him will be rewarded. So it's more of a, like we were talking the other day, a general statement, not necessarily in the chronological order that we're reading it according to the events. Yeah, yeah, I, I think I see what you mean, yeah. Re remember back in um, 
Second Corinthians. Um, where is it? We must all stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Stand before it, yeah. yeah I'm suddenly sure. blanking out as to where that is. Anyway, um, yeah, here it is. Okay. This is uh, 2 Corinthians 5, verse 11. He says, For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, the Dima, that each one may receive what is due him for the things done while in the body, whether good or bad. So there is a sense in which all, all of us will be judged. But fortunately, for believers, that judgment won't be eternal separation from God. You'll, we'll never, uh, as, as Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians chapter 1, we will be saved from the wrath of God. So, yeah, to be in heaven is reward enough, but there will be recognition of our, our, our deeds, our service, what we, what we did. Uh, that brought glory to God and, you know, build up his body and fed people and encouraged the saints and all that goes with that. So both of them. But to me, this is, I, I think it's interesting the way he singles out sort of each category. Uh, and, and he calls them your servants. And he starts with whom? Prophets. The prophets and then saints, saints and those who fear your name. Yeah, small and, small and great. Yeah. So nobody's left out in the body of Christ. And, um, and then he says, but for those who destroyed the earth, in other words, the, the, we'll see more of that later uh, uh, in the wrath of God, but he's talking about unbelievers and those who have defiled his creation, not only defiled his name and rebelled against him, but defiled his creation too. And uh, so there's, there's, there's going to pay day someday uh, for unbelievers, but also we're, we're exhorted to be careful and, and, and serving and because uh, there will be recognition and rewards for that. I don't know exactly what it'll look like. I'll just be glad to be there, you know, whether I get a prize, <laughs> but I don't even know what it'll look like. But <laughs> yeah. the door. There you go. The other, the other piece that I see here, it's actually like their prayers are answered. If they prayed, thy kingdom come, in, in verse 16, it says, We give thanks to you, Lord God, the one who is and who was, because you've taken your great power and you've begun to reign. So it's begun, mm -hmm. and, it, it, and it's a good thing. Yeah. And what happens to the people that are not necessarily non-believers, but never had the opportunity to know God? That's a great question, and we'll, we're going to talk about that a little bit later on. Not okay. tonight, but yeah. That's always a question. It, God, just know this, that God's justice in, is fair. Mm -hmm. And there are, you know, I've, I've got a whole thing we'll, later on when we get to chapter 20, we'll talk about that. Thursday I'm not tonight. going anywhere tonight. <laughs> 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 we'll make it tonight, though. <laughs> Stay tuned. But that's, that's a that's an excellent question. Yeah. That's one that many of us struggle with in one way. What of the unevangelized? What of those who have never had the chance to hear it so far? All right. Okay. Um, now let's any other any any other comments on chapter eleven? I know it was a toughie in, in a way when we started and all this about the two witnesses and so forth, but in general, we're called the the big question in chapter seven was who in the world can stand in the light of the anger, the wrath of God, and all this is coming. And, and, and that question is answered to here. The, the question is, and what is the church today called to be and to do in, in, the, in the light of all that's happening in, in God's uh, work in this world? And what are we called to be and to do based on chapter 11? Hmm? Couldn't hear me. Believe. believe. Believe, yeah. Give thanks. thanks. And, and, yeah. and spread the word. And, yeah, witness. Witness yeah. sing yeah. God's praises. Yeah, there you go. And, yeah, it's all. Yeah, good. Yeah, to reflect, yeah, his glory. All right. Um, and no matter how bad things look, God can bring life out of death. He can bring good out of evil. He, can, he will ultimately triumph. A regime change is coming. All right. Just one more uh, last comment. 
early in the in the book, John sees heaven. The heavens right. are open, and he sees the glory of God. Now, right before the wrath really comes, God gi again gives the glimpse of heaven, mm -hmm. and the 24 elders glorifying God. So mm -hmm. it's almost like a preempt to end times. That's a good insight, David. Keep in mind that John's purpose, well, Jesus speaking through John to us, is saying things are not what they seem on the surface. He said, here's how, here's, here's insights as to, uh, here's, here are the spiritual realities of the future. Here, here's, here's God, what he's going to do in the future, but he's also given us insight as to what's behind the scenes now. God at work as well as the evil side, as Satan will be introduced to us big time in chapter 12, the dragon, as he was called. And so there are spiritual realities at work that sometimes we don't see on the surface. We just you know look around, we, it's no big deal. But behind us, uh, as chapter 12 will tell us, to use the famous movie series, the Star Wars are, <laughs> are going on. That would be a great title, a great, this would make a, chapter 12 would make a great action, thriller, you know, movie. But can I ask you a question? Sure. In, in, in my version, I don't know if anybody else has been different, on the uh, end of verse 18, for rewarding your servants, the prophets and saints, and all who fear your name, both small and great, and for destroying those who destroy the earth. Mm -hmm. Yes. Is there, is there, is that, are, are there other words used in that book? Do you think that's talking about destroying life on earth, or do you think that's physically destroying the earth? What do you think? Yes. <laughs> I think it's both. Both? Yeah, I mean, whoever worked against God's kingdom um, and spoke about God and basically turned people away, and then also those that destroyed his kingdom, right? The actual earth itself. That, so. uh, thank you, David. That's a great question, Jeff. What, what, what is what is our creation mandate? Genesis 1 and 2. What, we, what was man put on earth to do? And what was he charged with doing? Maintain the Care earth and the animals. Glorify God. And the sky. Yeah. Caretaker. Yeah, to be stewards, caretakers, uh, to develop what God had put there in his facility, to be co-workers with him <coughs> in developing all the, the resources that are in, in this earth. And for those who destroy it, that they're not just, you know, polluting the environment and bringing global war warming. We're talking about those who violated the, the creative covenant, the creative mandate. You know, it's going contrary to what God put us here to do. So it's just another, uh, I think, way of identifying uh, his wrath, who, who deserves it. So I guess I'm, my first question would be, what's considered destroying the earth? Yeah. If we build so much pavement that we don't have the proper grass, is that destroying the earth? If we cut down too many trees to build houses, is that, um, I mean, my, my mind goes off uh, into a million places yeah. that we do for daily life, but mm -hmm. I'm Genesis. sure God assumes we're going to be using wood for daily life, too. <laughs> but not to the extent that we do it. <coughs> well, that's what I'm saying. So I'm curious. <laughs> Perhaps that's why we have a hiccup right now called climate change. Well, the Earth's always had climate change. If we went through two cold periods. Uh, <laughs> not in 20 years. I, 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 I would propose to you that the, the climate change has accelerated since 1945 and 1946. I'm not telling you. <laughs> so, Jeff, this sounds like a good Thursday morning discussion <laughs> about the Greek word. Uh, okay, for, let's move yeah, on. thanks for the homework. For the word destroy, I, I have never looked at it. I just don't know. <laughs> Normally, the word destroy doesn't mean to um, extinguish. It means to render a no, to uh, to dismantle, to make it inoperative, to to bring harm and hurt to it. And so, I think I think we. Our creative mandate is to multiply. Yeah, that's what yeah. he told him, to, to multiply and have families. And, and, and also, he said, and to fill the earth. And then to, he says, I've given you all of this, and I want you to be stewards of it. And obviously, the things that he gave us to eat and mm -hmm. to enjoy our lives, but it's always within measure. It's, 
it's appropriate so that you don't end up in short in the short term killing yourself long term. You need to organize things, otherwise there's not enough food. Yeah, exactly. He gave us the perfect garden. And we were made to rule over the animals because we named them. God brought the yeah, animals yeah. to us. You have to have dominion. This, right. this, this one says, uh, and God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness and let them have dominion over the fish of the sea oh. and over the fowl of the air and over the cattle and over all the earth and over every creeping thing that creepeth upon the earth. Okay. So it's just to have dominion over. Yeah. And I think that's not destroying it, but organizing it. And, and I think God wants us to join I, I think in I think in the the new heavens and the new earth I think we're going to be I don't think we're going to be sitting there just thr what do you call it strumming strumming strum 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 a harp uh -huh. I think we're going to be co-workers in developing I, in creating and and, um, and exploring I, I think, you know, we say, why do people want to climb this mountain or go to there or do this? I think that's part of this inbuilt desire to, to find what's there. And then um, the good side is to create good things out of it to improve life and so forth. And that which contributes to wholeness and community and health, I think, is part of is the positive side of create our creation man. If we're made in his image, part of that image is to create. The image is marred right now, but in heaven it will be completely yeah. restored. So we will be creating and doing stuff. Mm -hmm. Okay, let's let's jump in for a few minutes as we to chapter twelve. And would somebody read verses one? If I get my glasses unplugged. One down through uh, verse nine. A great, a great portion appeared in heaven, woman clothed with the sun, with the moon and under her feet. And on her head a crown of twelve stars. She was pregnant and was crying out in the birth in birth pains, in the agony of giving birth. Then another portion appeared in heaven, a great red dragon, with seven heads and ten horns and seven diamonds. His tail swept down a third of the stars of heaven and threw them to the earth. Then the dragon stood before the woman who was about to bear a child, so that he might devour her child as soon as it was born. She gave birth, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who was to rule all the nations with a rod of iron. But the child was snatched away and taken to God and to his throne. And the woman fled into the wilderness where she had the place prepared by God so that there she can be, in, be nourished for 1,260 days. And war broke out in heaven. Michael and his angels fought against the dragon. The dragon and his angels fought back, but they were defeated. And there was no longer any place for them in heaven. The great dragon was thrown down, the ancient serpent, who was called the devil and Satan, the deceiver of the whole world, who was thrown down to the earth, Wow. So who are the main characters in this section, hmm. chapter 12? We have the woman, we have the son, we have Michael and, and Satan. Okay. And there's 260 yeah. more days. <laughs> <laughs> Which is so how many years? Three and a half years. Three and a half years. Yeah. Get that again? Okay. So he begins and says, this is what he saw. And he said, a great and wondrous sign appeared in heaven. Whenever you see the word sign, what does that indicate? Pay attention. Yeah. But what's the purpose of a sign? It's a message. Direction. To show us stuff. Information. It points to something other than itself. So mm -hmm. what he's seeing, it, it points to a, a, a bigger reality, a different reality. So, and, and then it's, so he's describing, first of all, this woman. And uh, how, is she how is she described? Pregnant and given birth. Okay. But before that, there's a few other descriptive mm -hmm. words. Yeah. 
close with the sun and with the moon under the feet. Oh, yeah, yeah. <clears throat> What's that all about, do you think? The 12 signs represent the 12 signs. Mm -hmm. It seems to describe the church. In the beginning, you think it's obviously Mary giving birth to Jesus, mm -hmm. um, but then later it's the, the church kind of goes and God protects it, almost like it becomes the church. So, so this woman that's being introduced in one sense is, is um, it, it, she signifies something. There's a, a deeper spiritual significance. So obviously, it, it's it's a combination of things. It's because she gives birth. It's and it. Who does it appear to be again, David? Who's, who's this pointing at? Mary. Mary, right. So it's pointing at, at Mary. But also, Mary represents something more here. Because see what's, how she is described? Yeah, she's more incredibly dressed than Mary ever could have been with the moon and the sun and the stars. So so she, could she represent the 12 tribes of Israel? Exactly, yep. She represents that the people of Israel in the past, and then that believing remnant, like those who are waiting patiently for the coming of Messiah. Remember some of the characters that are introduced in Luke 2? Uh, that, that were... Um, the Magi. Well, yeah, the Magi came, but in terms of the temple, remember they had to take Jesus up to have him for yeah, his, pur awesome. yeah, his purification and so forth. And uh, so you had Elizabeth and Zechariah, Simon and Anna, and um, and then it talks about the woman's other offspring. So it seems like this is Mary, but she's representing more the believing remnant from the Old Testament, and and, and it talks about her children. Mm -hmm. What do you think that points to? The believers. Right? Yeah, the believers who will come out of that, and so. She's a sign, and this, he sees it, she's described as a sign, but she says, it says that she was pregnant and cried out in pain as she was about to give birth. And then, we'll get to the birth of Jesus in a minute, but it says, then another sign, sign appeared in heaven. And what's that sign about? A red dragon. Yeah. Yeah. Enormous red dragon with seven heads and ten horns. See, I get lost in this stuff. I really do. Yeah. You're not the only one. <laughs> Why should I you be you different? Talk. It seems to me like a lot of symbolism. Like I said, to me, I like to use the word blessed mother. That's the way I like Say it again. The blessed mother. Yeah. Okay. Mother of Christ. And this is almost as though she's been raised to a much higher level mm -hmm. in heaven already. And this is almost as though when Jesus was born, wasn't it Herod that was sending out the people to kill the firstborn in Egypt? Yep. And the devil here is doing, he's coming after to devour mm -hmm. this new mm -hmm. entity coming into the world. Mm -hmm. and it's, you know, it's just, it's a different twist on it, but it's, it's interesting. Yeah. Yeah. Don, I, I feel your pain. It's easy, to, it, it's easy to get lost in trying to figure out how things and who represents what, but I think <coughs> Satan here is being described in, in various ways. It, the picture is being painted because it, I think I think God's intention, as we talked about in the beginning, is not only that we read, oh yeah, there's a Satan, but somehow he becomes alive and real. We see him as the enemy, the enemy behind what, what's what's unfolding, the evil that is there, and uh, what his control and influence. And so he's pictured here in, in the Old Testament. Evil was portrayed as as Leviathan and. Uh, uh, behemoth. They were the embodiments of chaos and evil. And you, you, you read about um, Leviathan often in the Psalms. And it says, comes out of the sea, which is, is the, the, the place of chaos. But the dragon here is, what's his color? Red. 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 What that might, what that? Blood. blood. Yeah. Mm -hmm. What's that, blood? Seven. He has seven heads. What does seven, seven indicate? Perfect. Seven tribes. No, no, that was crown. twelve. No, crown. Seven is complete. Yeah. Say it again. Yeah. It's a crown. Yeah, but but the the seven, yeah, the, the number seven usually indicates what? Completeness. Oh yeah, completeness. Right. Okay. 
So, so here he has seven heads. Seven is the number of completeness. The head is the symbol of authority. That you know, that from the head, we decide, we we will, we we make decisions and act. So he he has complete authority, and uh, although obviously it's ultimately only under the authority of God, he has ten horns. And what did a horn represent in, in um, strength? Yeah, strength. They, they talked about lift up my horn and so forth. David in his prayers and so forth. The horn of an ox pictured uh, strength. And so he has 10, and 10 <coughs> also is a number of what? Like seven. Completeness. Completeness, yeah. Mm -hmm. And so he's, here you have a, a he is completely strong. And as, and as Martin Luther wrote in his famous hymn that we sing occasionally, A Mighty Fortress, it says, on earth is not his equal. So, and, and then it goes on and describes him with diadems on his head. Now, what, what in the world are diadems? Uh, crown? Crown. Yeah. Crown. And it's a symbol of what? Royalty. Royalty, power, wealth, yeah. And so this <laughs> one writer said, this dude is rich. He's really rich. This this guy, Satan, is powerful. He's a formidable foe. And don't ever forget it. And part of the the use of imagery is to is to drive home a picture, uh, a graphic description of, of the enemy. And um, so our time is, is basically up here, but at any rate, we'll get into this more next week, Lord willing. Mm -hmm. so and uh, it, it told us she fled, they fought, and then it goes on to tell us about her, and we got to wait to find out what happened to the baby. <laughs> <laughs> I tell you what happened. What happened to the baby? We're already going to the baby. Yeah. It just says her baby was snatched up to God. Exactly. Which I feel. And we'll, we'll talk about that. You know, why such a brief. You know, Jesus came, he was born, and he, they tried, Herod, as, as somebody pointed out, tried to kill him and so forth. And, uh, and why does it say, go into descriptions of, well, he, he preached the gospel, he healed the sick, you know, he, he did this and so forth, and this, you know, but it doesn't, it just says he was born and snatched up to God. And you say, wow, well, that's, that's kind of a brief, why, but that's this. That's why we don't know anything about, one, about the early years. Well, <laughs> yeah, well, wait a minute, it says it was snatched up and then they fought, right? Isn't that, I, I've read it a couple of times, isn't that? Well, it says the drag, dragon stood in front of the woman who was about to give birth so that he might devour her child. So that, and, and it says the moment he, he was, it was born, she gave birth to a son, a male child, who will rule all the nations with an iron scepter. And her child was snatched up to God. And that, that, that's taking the whole advent and the life of Christ and, and condensing it into born and raised. Why did Jesus come? To die for our sins. Yeah. And so, I mean, it, in a sense, it's, it's, it's like we say, well, wasn't there a lot more that happened along the way? But here it's just, it, there's, a, there's a, we'll see this in 2 Timothy 3.16. Just read that quickly, and then we, we need to stop. I've got to be obedient to uh, Father Joe. 2 Timothy 3.16. There's a, a poem or a hymn, and it says this. Or is it first? No, it's First Timothy. Uh, <laughs> okay. And it says this. It, it says, beyond all question, the min, mi, the mystery of godliness is great. And then he and then this hymn comes. He appeared in a body, was vindicated by the Spirit, was seen by angels, was preached among the nations was believed on in the world, was taken up into glory. And it, again, it's a very summary, quick summary of, of the whole scope of his life and what he was here for. He came to die. Yeah. The, and, and, and then the ascension shows, you know, we know it was Jesus that's talking about because he says he will rule, rule the nations. But at any rate, it's a, this is a fascinating, I, I've never heard a, an Advent message from this passage 
but that's what it's all about. Mm -hmm. We'll talk more about it next week. All right. Any other prayer requests, gentlemen? Anything else you want to share as we dismember before we dismember? I need prayer for the people of Haiti. Oh yeah. yeah. Thank you for bringing yeah. that up. That's what's what's the death count? As 15, of 1600 something. Oh. What a place. They just get hammered about every other year. Ten years ago it was a quarter million. Yeah, that was oh, yeah. And we have we support the Salvation Army that's in Haiti. Any anything mm -hmm. else that we're doing in Haiti? Or is that mm -hmm. America is down there? Yeah. America yeah. is just down there too. Okay. They're out of stamp too. Oh, okay. All right. Well, David, would you mind closing us in a word of prayer? I'd love to. Okay. Lord God, we glorify you and thank you for this evening. We thank you for the wisdom that you have placed in our hearts, Lord. And we're grateful, Father, for who you are, your sovereign, perfect will. And we thank you, Lord, for the hope that you put in our hearts, knowing that you are in control of all. We thank you for the word this evening, Lord God. We pray that we would take it into our spirit and we would live out mm. uh, this spirit that you have given us, Lord. Mm. Bless this day. Bless each member here. Allow us, Lord God, to go out and come to know you deeper, more closer relationship, Father. Mm. Bless us and keep us safe. And we ask all this in the precious name of your son, Jesus. Amen. 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 Thank um, you. Just a reminder that Thursday we're going to be meeting.